crossroads. Y'all miss the cue, but we're going to praise the Lord anyway. Welcome to our worship service, our worship celebration. So glad that you're here again today. As faithful as God has been, we want to show our gratitude and our praise for all that he has done for us. Amen. Are you ready to worship the Lord? We're going to do it in just a minute to hold on to that praise. For those that are watching uh, with us online, please take this time to grab your communion elements. We're going to go to the table after our, serve, uh, our worship uh, time. So let's get our, ourselves prepared. Let's prepare our hearts. God has been good, and we want to share with everyone just how good God has been. Amen? Amen. So let us go to the Lord in prayer and prepare our hearts for our worship portion of our service. God, thank you so much. You've been grateful. I mean, you've been faithful. We're grateful. We thank you, God, that you have brought us back here. We're safe. We're in good health. Our hearts are full of praise and adoration to you, God. So, Lord, we pour out everything that's within us at your feet. Our worries, our, our fears, our concerns, our doubts. And, Lord, we just want you to fill us with all of the faith that we need. Grow us, oh God. Let us pour out, God, our gratitude to you. Because no one can do what you've done. There's no one that's better than you. There's no one that's like you, oh God. So, God, we recognize that. And we're here to just share with one another how grateful we are that's our testimony oh God so be with us this morning oh Lord guide us through this service and grow us in you oh Lord so in the name of Jesus we pray amen amen let's put our hands together for our worship leader who will lead us to this morning in song good morning everyone I pray you all are doing well how's everybody doing yeah are we ready to worship the Lord this morning? I don't know about you, but I have found that the Lord is better to me than anything or anybody that I have ever experienced. My greatest experience pales in comparison to what God has done for me. And I know that I believe most of you can say that. So today we're going to say, we're going to declare that his love for us is better than life. Are you ready to declare it today? All right. Here we go. Put your hands together like this. And as we sing today, I want you to just put your mind on God. Focus on Jesus, not on anybody or anything else. Just focus on Jesus, our Savior, okay? Your love is everlasting, it's an everlasting love. Your mercy is as new as every rising of the sun. And your loving kindness, loving kindness is better than life. Grace is all sufficient, it's an all sufficient grace. Your power and your glory are forever on display. And your loving kindness, your loving kindness is better than life. Singing, oh, it's better, oh, it's better. than life. Let's tell him the fairest of 10,000. Here we go, sing. Fairest of 10,000, of 10,000 you are fair. And nothing in this world could ever measure or compare to your loving kindness. Your loving kindness is better than life. are just oh lord you're just in all your ways and i will lift my hands oh lord in gratitude and praise for your loving kindness your loving kindness is better than life come on sing oh oh it's better oh it's better Come 
better Sing in Jesus Your loving kindness Sing, oh It's better, y'all Sing, oh It's better It's better than life. His loving kindness toward us is better than life. Come on, sing. Better than life. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's better than life. Come on, sing one more time. It's better than life. It's better than life. Last time. It's better than life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give him a hand clap of praise. His loving kindness is better than life if we don't have his loving kindness our lives would be miserable do you know that if you didn't have the mercy of the lord and the grace of the lord the forgiveness of the lord and the power of the lord where would we be how could we do anything when we think about his goodness and his faithfulness and his love it makes us want to worship him doesn't it if you think about how faithful he's been from last Sunday to this Sunday, and you know that some of the things you experienced, you couldn't have done it without him. When you know that you loved somebody this week that was unlovable, you could only have done that through the grace and the love of God. So to have him in our lives, we should, we should want to worship him. We should want to pour out love to him because he's so deserving of it. And without him, our lives would be miserable. So let's tell the Lord, let's just tell him that we've come to worship him, singing. I worship you. Worship him. I worship you.
Appreciate your grace and your love toward us. Forgive us for when we take it for granted, God. Forgive us when we don't give the grace that you have given to us to others, God. Forgive us when we take for granted your love and your mercy. God, forgive us when we fail to worship you, when we take other things to be our God except you being our God. Lord, forgive us for when we just didn't do what you in all your loving kindness told us to do. God, we come today with, for, with hearts of uh, repentance and hearts of gratitude and, our, and hearts that are longing to be with you. We thank you that we can connect with you in worship and in song this morning. And we pray, God, that you would continue to be gracious to us and we would continue to worship you and give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise because there is none like you, God. Nowhere is there anyone like you. And we find it a privilege. We count it an honor to be able to worship you this morning. We pray, God, you would receive our worship. And as we continue to worship you through communion and through the word, you would work in us and through us your perfect will and we would surrender and say yes to you God this is our prayer in Jesus name amen amen just continue to reflect and meditate on the fact that there is no one like him the Bible said that he is perfect in all of his ways. There's no one more patient, no one more faithful, no one more loving, no one more forgiving. There's no one like him. And that's why we celebrate what we celebrate when we celebrate it every time we get a chance to celebrate just how great and awesome a God we serve. He thought ahead of time to institute this ordinance of communion that we might remember and reflect on just how loving he was and still is. And so as we prepare our hearts, let us prepare it now just focusing on that fact that no one was worthy enough to do what he did. No one. No one. That's why the God we serve sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. We thank God for that. On that night with his disciples, knowing what he was about to endure, he prepared his disciples as he's preparing us. He took the bread that represented his body, said, this is my body. He lifted it, 
gave thanks for it. He broke it. He says, as often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. His body was broken for us. And he commanded his disciples to eat all of it. Let us eat together. Likewise, he took the cup. This cup, he said, represents a new covenant, a covenant in my blood. This blood would be poured out for the remission of your sins. He said, as often as you do this, you're proclaiming, you are proclaiming, that he died for your sins, that he rose from the dead, and he's coming back. As often as you do this, you're doing it in remembrance of him. Then he commanded his disciples to drink all of it. Let us drink together. Let us now pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And praise the Lord, everyone. Let's give him a great big hand praise. Come on. Give him a great big hand praise. For the Lord is good. Amen. Amen. Today, uh, I want to greet you all in the name of Jesus Christ. But I also want to say to you, help me greet one another who is here. So just wave and greet and wave and greet. Because we're not really touching right now. But just wave and greet and wave and greet uh, one another in the house of the Lord today. I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for all of your gifts and contributions that was made to Haiti last week uh, and over the past two weeks. Many of you have contributed. And so I have an email that I'd like to read to you from Evans Paul. It says, hello, Pastor Joseph and the Crossroads Covenant Church family. Good morning. How encouraging it was for my family to see you guys at Crossroads join us in the call that we have for Haiti, which is walking alongside the people of Haiti by participating in joining God in what he is doing in Haiti through the different ministry areas where we are involved, and especially by joining people of the south, south, south part of Haiti, uh, who have been affected by this recent earthquake which killed more than 2,000 people. More than 50,000 houses got destroyed and damaged. We can say that because of all of you uh, who join hands together to support these, family in des these families in desperate need, Haiti gets stronger. Praise God. Thank you, uh, Crossroads from the bottom of our hearts for joining God and his family and our family to continue bringing Christ hope, Christ healing, and Christ encouragement to the people of Haiti. Please continue to keep us in your prayers. We want you to know that we're praying for you as well. And this is from Evans and Karina Paul, missionaries to Haiti. Let's give the Lord a great big hand praise. We're so glad that we were able to help. 
he will be, he is home this week. He will be traveling very soon to Haiti. He says, I'm going to send some pictures. And if you can, I'd like for you to show your congregation, not only the devastation, but also the healing that God is doing. Isn't that wonderful? That's really wonderful. Thank all of you who have given though. Thank you so much. Um, today, we're going to study a passage from 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're talking about God is faithful, and God is faithful. Yes, God is faithful. Yeah, God is faithful. Yes, God is faithful. God is faithful. The government might fail you, but God is faithful. Yeah, yeah. Friends might fail you, but God is faithful. God is faithful. And that's what we're talking about. God is faithful. He was faithful to lead his people out of Egypt by a pillar of cloud. That's faithful. He didn't leave them. He stuck with them. He's faithful to take us through the process of sanctification. That's faithful. Because we some hard-headed people sometimes. Oh, yeah, and we go backwards and we go forward. We go to the side. We turn our back and say, no, Lord, I ain't doing that. But he's faithful. He never leaves us. He sticks with us. He is so faithful that even in the midst of the storm that you thought was sent to destroy you, he's really building your faith. He's strengthening you and working you out so that you could be a stronger Christian for him. So today in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we're going to take a look at what this Bible has to say about God being faithful and why is he being so faithful to his people. If you have it, please stand with me. I'm going to read verses 1 through 9. I'd like for you to read it <clears throat> along with me. You got it? Okay, here we go. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, and ourselves as his servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power of, is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Per perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Today, I want to talk about my soul is anchored. My soul is anchored. My soul is anchored. Are you anchored? My soul is anchored. Would you bow your heads and pray with me, please? Father, we give you thanks for today, for just the blessing of a brand new day. Many of us are blessed because it's a three-day weekend, and others of us are just blessed. But God, whatever the case is, we know it's all from you because all good things come from you. So, Lord, today we pray that you will strengthen us and that, God, you will be with us and that, God, you will teach us today from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may take your seats. My soul is anchored. My soul is anchored. Can you say that? Can you say it one more time? Now, can you point to yourself and can you say it? My soul is yes, yes. And we're telling a great truth. Now, I'm using this term anchored in the sense of something that is stable on a ship that keeps the ship from floating away. You see, 
I'm using the term of the anchor as not, okay, I'm okay, but as I am able to give strength and support to someone else. I'm able, because God has strengthened me, I'm able to do something that I could not do before. I'm able to give support and strength to someone else so that the winds and the waves won't carry them away. This is very, very important because this is what the Bible is telling us this morning in this passage, anchored. I'm sure you've heard the story of somebody being an anchor in a life. A few weeks ago, I attended a funeral service, and it was for a woman who had done many great things. One person stood, and they said this. They said that when I got to a point in my life where I was ready to give up, when I reached a point in my life where everything seemed to be worth nothing, when I thought that I was going to throw in the towel, they were my anchor. They stayed with me and they kept me from floating away even in my faith. Anchored. Are you anchored? Are you anchored? Are you anchored? We always say that God is faithful. We always say that my soul is anchored, and that's a beautiful song. And We always love those choruses that bring back the memory of how he has blessed us and how he has kept us. But what are we anchored in? What are we anchored in? What is this thing being anchored? Why are we anchored? Why did he do this for us? What is he doing? Well, everything that God does is for his glory, number one. It's not for your pleasure, not for my pleasure. It's all for his glory. Yeah, so sometimes God does difficult things in our life, but he brings about something beautiful for him. Yeah, sometimes God takes us through a little uncomfortable time, but it's good for his glory. Sometimes God puts you in a situation, but it's not for you, it's for the person who's in there with you, like in Acts 16. Paul and Silas were in the prison but it wasn't for them. It was for the prisoners who were all captive and God wanted to free the prisoners so he had to put Paul and Silas in the prison to free the prisoners. So sometimes being an anchor is not always comfortable. It's not always what you want, but it's for God's glory. It's all for God's glory. Can you say amen? All for God's glory. Now, when you say amen, what you're saying is, okay, Lord, I accept that truth in my life because, Lord, I've been through some things. Lord, I've endured some things. Lord, I've faced some heartaches. Lord, I've had some pains. Lord, things have been disappointing in my life, but I understand that it's for your glory. Yes, sir. Because it's for your glory, Lord, it's all worth it. In verse 1 of this passage, we learn that we are anchored in the priesthood. We are anchored in the priesthood, anchored in the priesthood. What is this thing, the priesthood? You know what a priest was in the Old Testament? A priest was the one who had a bloody job. He had the uncomfortable job of slicing up the animal, of placing the animal on the altar, and that sacrifice would burn up to the Lord. He had the uncomfortable position to sprinkle blood. Oh, Lord, how many of you would like that job? I, let me sprinkle some blood here to offer up the sacrifices of atonement for others who would sin. The priest's job was to intercede for the people on God's behalf, but to also speak the words of God to the people. That was the priest's job. We are anchored in the priesthood. We are anchored in the priesthood. The Bible says in verse 1 of chapter 4, we have this ministry. We have it. We have it. We have this ministry. Do you see it? Do you see it? We have this ministry. Not if you want it. We have this ministry. Not you could buy it. We have this ministry. Not sometimes. But we have this ministry ministry. We have this ministry. Please pay attention. The word ministry here in the Greek means service, like an enlisted man in the military or an enlisted person in the military. They're in service. You know, when you're in the military, you don't do what you want. You do what you're told. 
In the military, you have to follow the orders. You, in the military, you get a good workout even when you don't want to. You get up when you don't want to. You, you go to bed when you might not feel like it. You might want to take a, a leave and go somewhere. But in the military, because you have this service that you're performing, you might have to sacrifice even your life in the military. So this term ministry is what we have. We have this ability, we have this opportunity to be in service for the Lord God Almighty. We have this opportunity to serve him and serve him alone. We have this ministry. Now, please note, it says we have. We is collective. We is everybody. As soon as you gave the Lord your heart, you were signed up. You were drafted into the army of the Lord. And so because you're part of his military enlistment, because you're part of his army, because you belong to him, because you serve him, you have this ministry. You've got it. It was given to you. It was government issue. Now, because we have it, we got to understand this is not just the pastor. It's not just the pastor who's supposed to be the minister because all of us are enlisted in the service. Everybody is listed in the service of prayer. Everybody's enlisted in the service of sharing. Everybody's enlisted in the service of giving. And so we are in the service of God. This is what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. You also, you also, also, he means collectively, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. That's the priesthood. <clears throat> uh, uh, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ. What is Peter telling us? Peter is saying that Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, has carefully placed you where he wants you to be in this spiritual temple that offers him sacrifices as the holy priesthood, as the priesthood that's set aside for him. So we are anchored in this priesthood. We are there in this priesthood because God has placed us there. Wait a minute. We are there in this priesthood because God has positioned us so that we can help others not to stray away. What he's telling us is, because we're anchored, we do not lose heart. That means give up. You know, we don't lose heart. I remember one time my daughter was, uh, she was minding the children, and she said, if they call me mommy one more time. <laughs> well, it's not that she was not going to stop being their mama, but she was just tired and ready to get herself some rest. I'm sure many of you have felt like that. But with the ministry, he says, we do not lose heart. We do not give up. We, see, we can give up on something that we start, but we can't give up on something that he started. Here's why. He said, the gates of hell will not prevail. That means that his church will go on and on. Nothing is going to stop it. Hello? Nothing can hinder it. Come on now. Nothing can oppose it. But we got this ministry that we have to Fulfill, so it's onward, Christian soldiers. Because we got this ministry. We're in this priesthood together. This ministry is to reveal Christ to everybody. To everybody. Not just to people who you like, but to everybody. The Bible says that their minds are veiled, and we got the job to remove the veil. Now, pay attention to this. A veiled mind, a mind is delicate, right? But you have to remove the veil with care. It has to be done delicately. I'm sure you've been to a wedding, and the bride comes in, and she's veiled. And we all go, as soon as the bride comes in, you notice that when the groom comes in, everybody goes, ha, ha, ha. But then when the bride comes in, everybody goes, oh, everybody just, ha, oh, just captivated by her beauty, right? And then... As she comes forward, she has a veil, so you really can't see her face until it's time for them to uh, seal this deal with a kiss, 
and then the veil is pulled back. Notice how the veil is removed. The maid of honor, I'm going somewhere. The maid of honor steps up and delicately lifts that veil and puts it over, not to smudge the makeup in any way. She pulls that veil back so gently and so delicately, and then she makes sure that it's in the right place because the bride got to be looking good. Our job is not to rip off the veil and give you the truth. No, our veil is to go up to souls who have been discarded, go up to souls who are lost and who are abandoned, go up to souls and to gently lift the veil off of their face and then to behold the glory of Jesus Christ in them. Not judge them, but to behold the beauty of Christ in them and then give them that mirror and let them see Christ. And that mirror is us, the priesthood. We are to show Christ to the world. Are you anchored? Are you anchored? Isaiah chapter 40 verse 1 says, comfort. Comfort my people. Don't yell at them. Don't put them down. Don't beat them. Comfort them. The, the term of comfort in, in, in the Hebrew is saying, caress them gently. Give them your comfort. Hold them close to your chest. Comfort them. That's part of this ministry. That's part of the ministry we have. We're anchored in the priesthood. We're also anchored in his personality. We're anchored in his personality. We're anchored in the personality of Jesus. Who's your root? Who's your root? Jesus. Who, who do you serve? Jesus. Jesus. Who do you love? Jesus. Jesus. We're anchored in his personality because all of those things, service, love, and compassion, we would not understand it unless we were rooted, unless we were anchored in him. We didn't know love before. Let, let me go on here. We, I like this part. In verse 7, it says, we have this treasure in jars of clay. We have this treasure in jars of clay. We have this treasure in jars of clay. Does that make sense? We have these treasures in jars of clay. Who puts a treasure in a jar of clay? <laughs> That's like a piggy bank, right? And if you have a child, you use the piggy bank to show them, put your pennies and your coins in here, and one day you're going to have enough money to buy something, right? Unless you have a clever child who discovers that if you just tap on the bottom of that clay piggy bank, it'll put a hole in it and you just put a sock in it so your parents won't know that you got a hole in there and you take the money out anytime you want. Now, don't ask me which one of my children did that. I'm not giving up the goods on them. But we are jars of clay. We are jars of clay. A hole can easily be placed in us. We're jars of clay. We're not a safe. A safe is something that is very strong. It, it would do, it, it endures fire. You, you can't get into a safe easily. That's where you put your fancy diamond rings. That's why you put your, your bank books. That's why you keep all your valuables in the safe. If we were the safe, we might depend on ourselves. We might say, I'm the anchor. I'm the strength. I'm the one who's doing this. But we got to be a jar of clay so we can say, God, you're doing this. God, you're keeping me. God, you're using me. God, it's all about you. It's not about me. We're jars of clay. Fallible. Fallible but moldable. Clay is moldable. And so what God does is he takes this clay, you and I, puts us in his hand and gets the rough edges off. He, he smooths us out. He shapes us as he wants us to be shaped. He, he molds us into his image, not ourself. He, he takes this fragile lump of clay with all of, our, all of our hopes and all our dreams. And he says, let me fix this so that it's my hope, that it's my dream. He, he takes this jar of clay. He, he takes this big old lump of clay that's got all these impurities in him. And sometimes it mars, but he says, nothing can mar my work. My hands will curve that, bar, that jar uh, the right way after I'm done with it. There'll be a jar of clay for my use his personality. They will reflect me. You can tell the work of an artist, not by the signature on the bottom, 
but by the shape of the vessel. God says, you are in my personality. You're anchored in my personality. And because you're anchored in my personality, when people look at you, they'll know you belong to me. You ain't got to have no sign on your forehead that says, I'm a Christian. You ain't got to have no big T-shirt to say, I'm with Christ. You ain't got to have all that. All you got to do is be anchored in his personality. We're molded into his personality. Why? What was, what's going on here? In Acts chapter 26, Acts chapter 26 and chapter and verse 25, Paul spoke reverently and carefully to Festus, the leader. And he says, Festus, God has molded me. You see, I used to be one who persecuted the church, but God got a hold of me, this piece of clay. And God molded my mouth. He molded my mind. He molded my heart. And because God has molded me, Festus, I'm carrying something inside of me, something valuable called the Holy Spirit. I got a good news. I got good news for you. It's the good news of salvation, but I could not give it to you unless Christ had molded me. We're molded into his personality. We're molded into his personality to show compassion. In Matthew chapter 9, Matthew chapter 9, the Bible says this, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for they were harassed. They were helpless. They were like a sheep without a shepherd. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been harassed? Have you ever felt helpless? Hello, somebody. Have you been there? Yeah, I've been there, and it's not a good feeling. But here is Jesus Christ who had compassion on our soul, had compassion on our life. Here is Jesus Christ who took us as a lump of clay, as, as fallible as we were, and molded us into his personality so that we can have compassion. Guess what? You don't have compassion unless you got Christ. Yeah, you don't have compassion without Christ. We have nothing without Christ. You see, there are people who are walking all around us, and they're helpless. They're walking all around us, and they're harassed. And we would say, oh, my goodness, there ain't no, ain't, ain't no help for them. We will walk by them and say, oh, that, that, that's worthless right there. But God says, no, that's not worthless because I made them in my image just like I made you in my image. And I want you to have compassion on them because they don't have the guidance. They don't have no mother to lead them. They don't have a father to guide them. They don't have any family to surround them. But if you are the family of God and you will be their spiritual family members, you will be the anchor filled with compassion. And you will be able to guide and strengthen them. We're molded by Jesus Christ into his personality of love. Is it amazing to you that Jesus said to us, love your neighbor? Check that out. Love your neighbor. Jesus doesn't say, love your mother, love your father, love your siblings, love your half-siblings. He says, love your neighbor. Isn't that odd? My neighbor, why should I have such affection for my neighbor? I don't know him. I live in a community with him. I walk down the street and I see him. But why do I love them? One of the teachers of the law asked Jesus this question. Well, who is my neighbor? We get like that sometimes. Well, Lord, what did you really mean when you said love? <laughs> love, what, when you said my neighbor, what you talking about in my city, in my county? What were you talking about? <laughs> and Jesus gave in Luke chapter 10 the illustration of the Good Samaritan. He says that a man was traveling down a road. A man, an unknown man was traveling down the road. And he was robbed and beaten and laid by the side of the road. And here comes a priest, the holy man, walking from Jerusalem. Ain't that something? And as he is walking from the city where he just worshiped, here it is. He sees this man and he says, let me cross over on the other side of the road because he might defile me. Then comes a Levite, the keeper of the temple. And the, the Levite, he walks, he says, mm, that man show is beat up bad. I wonder, is he Okay. Well, let me keep on going where I'm going. And then Jesus, to show this great love, 
takes a Samaritan. A Samaritan was the worst thing that a Jew could be around. They despised the Samaritan. And here comes this Samaritan. And he picks the man up, puts him on his donkey while he walks. That's love. He gets him to an inn and tells the innkeeper, I got to go away, but I'm going to give you some money. Take care of him. That's love. And then he says, whatever is short, I'll pay you when I come back. That's love. What Jesus was saying is, love somebody who don't look like you, who is not your kind. Love somebody who might not even be your same color, but love them enough to go into your pocket and give to them. Love them enough to let them ride while you walk. Love them enough to stay with them when nobody else would love them. There's no greater power in the world than God's love. And his church is supposed to demonstrate his love at all times. Are you anchored? Are you anchored? Are you anchored in his love? Are you anchored in his compassion? Are you anchored? You see, it's necessary for us to be anchored because we don't understand all the things that's going on around us, but this is what we do know. We're anchored in his protection. We're anchored in his protection. How many of you have been protected by the Lord this week? How many of you have driven somewhere this week and God protected you? I'm not talking about your safe vehicle. I'm talking about how God protected you. How many of you went to sleep at night and you got up and you was all right the next day? Nobody broke into your house. Nobody robbed you while you were asleep. How many of you know that God protected you? It wasn't your, bur uh, your burglar alarm. It was God who protected you. Hello, somebody. It wasn't your neighborhood watch. It was God who protected you. It was the angels that he sent to watch over you all night long. It was God himself. While you slept, he didn't. You're anchored in his protection. Listen to this. We're anchored in his protection for a reason. Because this ministry that we have, it ain't easy. It ain't easy. It's not easy to love your neighbor. It's not easy to be compassionate. It's not easy to show mercy. It's not easy. It's not easy. It's not easy. But we are sheltered with his protection when we get into situations that aren't easy. And this ministry is not easy. But you know, because this ministry is not easy, God still is faithful. God is still faithful. Let me show you how faithful he is. God is so faithful that when we are pressed for the gospel's sake, we are not crushed. We are pressed, but not crushed. You know, aluminum can, you could take aluminum can and you could drink out of it, then you can crush it with your bare hands. The Bible says we can get pressed, but we're not crushed because he shelters us. His shelter is, okay, come into my covering when life gets so difficult, when it's so difficult for you to exist, come into my covering and I will give you rest. I will be your shelter. I will be your guide. I'll be the one who secures your soul. How faithful is he? He is so faithful that when we are persecuted for the gospel's sake. Uh, we've been lied on, cheated, talked about, mistreated. We've been buked, scorned, talked about sure as you're born. That's persecution. That's persecution. He says, when we have been persecuted for the gospel's sake, not because you did something wrong, but just for the gospel's sake. You're trying to live right. You're trying to obey God and pray. You're trying to be kind to your neighbor. You're trying to do all the things that the Word says that you're supposed to do. Just because you're trying to do what God has said, you're persecuted. He says, but this, we are not abandoned. He will not leave us alone. So while others are running you down, he's right there with you. While others are looking at you funny, he's looking at you with love. He's never leaving you. He's never forsaking you. He is always there with you. You can be persecuted, but you will not be abandoned because God himself will never, ever leave us. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> he's faithful enough that when we are struck down, we're not destroyed. We're struck down. We get a blow. Boom. We hit the ground. Now, trust me, as a Christian, we got this ministry. We will get some blows. Oh, there are some blows. Oh, there are some blows. Oh, but look, we will not be destroyed. We will not be destroyed. I like this. He protects us. 
He protects us when we're struck down so that we are not destroyed. So I can take the blow, rope a dope, but I am not destroyed because I can come back. Oh, 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 check it out. A father was drinking and he would come home and he would be intoxicated and he would go into one of his son's room, the youngest son. And when he would walk into his youngest son's room without any warning, he would get the extension cord and begin to whip him. He begin to beat his son. But the son's older brother, <laughs> the son's older brother would come into the room and he would climb over his brother and put his body where the brother's body should have been getting the hits. And every, every blow that the brother received, he would take it. He didn't cry. He didn't whimper. He, he, he just took the blows. And when the father had realized what he was doing, he would walk out the room and the brother would look at him and say, don't worry. As often as this happens, he might come in and strike you again tonight, but don't worry about it. I'll be there. And I will protect you from the blows. I will take the blows that you receive. God says, they're not hitting you. They're hitting me. They're not coming against you. They're coming against me. But they don't know that. They're too intoxicated in their mind to understand they are attacking me. They're not attacking you. And the blows that are you are receiving will not destroy you. You won't be destroyed. I don't care how much money they got. I don't care what material things they got. Bible says you'll be struck down, but not destroyed. Because your soul is anchored. Because your soul is anchored. Because your soul is anchored. The billows may come. The breakers may crash. But don't give up because he holds you fast. Your soul is anchored. Though the storms keep on raging in my life, and sometimes it's hard to tell the night from day, still that hope that lies within is reassured as I keep my eyes upon that distant shore. I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. I know he is faithful to lead me safely through. Yeah. Hallelujah. 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 How are we anchored? Why are we anchored? When do we get anchored? We got anchored over 2,000 years ago when Jesus Christ took that cross and went up to Calvary, when he stretched himself wide, when they hung him high, where they pierced his hands, where they pierced his feet, where they pierced uh, his head with a crown of thorns, where they pierced his side. That's how we became anchored. Through the blood of Jesus, through the blood of Jesus, through the blood of Jesus, we're only anchored because of his blood. And we're purchased because God is faithful. God's purchase is everlasting. And when he purchased us once and for all, he says, don't worry about it. You're anchored in me now. I will mold you into my personality. I will protect you from the onslaughts of life. But you are called into my priesthood. And I'm going to anchor you in my priesthood. Don't think that you can't do it. Don't think that you don't know enough about it. Don't think that you don't understand it. You don't have to have a theology degree to understand that God is faithful. That God is faithful. That God is faithful. Let your testimony be, my God is an awesome God. My God is faithful even when I'm not. My God is everlasting. My God is almighty. And my God can do whatever he wants to do whenever he wants to do it, however he wants to do it. Clap your hands and give God praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 Glory be to God. We are talking about God being faithful, but God being faithful is not just, okay, God, you're going to do whatever I need. It means that in the difficult times of life, as we pursue completing what he has for us to do, that he will remain faithful. There was a person who was assigned a task, and this person was assigned a task to complete a particular project. He was on his job. He found out that he had no hope, 
No one would help him. He was all by himself. He felt all abandoned and all alone. And he said, oh, my goodness, why did I accept this position? Why do I accept this responsibility? I'm trying to do the best I can, but there's no help. There's no one around me. But what he didn't realize was while he was in his cubicle, on the other side of that cubicle, somebody who he couldn't see, on the other side of that cubicle was somebody who was operating the system that was allowing him to get the work done. What he didn't understand was on the other side of that cubicle, on the wall that divided them, a person that he could not see was behind the scene making the phone calls that he needed to make, doing everything that needed to be done. That's what God is doing for you and I. We got this ministry, and sometimes we feel like, God, I just can't do it. But what we don't know is a person who we cannot see, Jesus Christ, is on the other side of that screen, operating on our behalf, making it all work out for his glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And praise the Lord. We're anchored. We're anchored in the Lord. We're anchored. We're anchored in the Lord. Don't let anyone make you lose your hold on Jesus Christ. You stay rooted, you stay grounded, you stay anchored in the Lord. Don't worry about what church you go to. Don't worry about all that other kind of stuff. Stay with the Lord. Stay with the Lord. Stay with the Lord. Stay with the Lord because the Lord won't fail you. The Lord will never leave you. He will always keep you anchored in him. Clap your hands and give God praise. <laughs> Father, we pray this morning that you will keep our soul anchored in you. We pray, God, for all of, the, uh, all of the Christians in the world. Many are enduring persecution. Let them know, God, that they won't be destroyed, that you'll be their shelter, you'll be their protector. We pray, God, for all the believers who have felt that I can't do this. This is too great what you're asking of me. But God, remind us that you said, take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Strengthen us, God, for this ministry that we have. And as we fulfill your will, we pray that you will receive glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all give God a great big praise, everyone. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. Come on, hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God. Well, praise God for another, another great word from him. Amen? Amen. 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 Uh, we need to understand that we can't go anywhere without that rudder, talking uh, nautically speaking. We can't go anywhere without the helm. But when that anchor is there, we can't pull that. We shouldn't pull that anchor up until God says it's time to go. Amen? Amen? And so to be anchored in him, for us to be committed, stay anchored in him. The Bible says in John that if we abide in him, in his word, abide in us. That's anchoring. Abide. Stay with him. Allow him to just protect us. We are going to get persecuted, but stay. Understand that we're being molded. God is faithful. Amen? Amen? So can I get your commitment to stay where he has us? Stay where he has you and understand that his protection is there. You're in his personality. He has called us to do his work. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we're getting ready to go. I hope you have been filled with the Spirit. I pray that you've been encouraged by our service today. Those that are watching online, thank you for tuning in every Sunday at 10. And join us again next Sunday at 10 when we will celebrate our 16th anniversary. Amen. Let's give God praise for 16 years. Yes. That's anchoring right there, 16 years. We've been anchored in him for 16 years, and God has been faithful. We've been up and we've been down. We've gone through it, but we are still here. Praise God. And God still has work for us to do. And so let us celebrate next week, next Sunday, 
at 10 o'clock. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that those are watching online, we still have space available. Amen? Okay, Sister Jared, don't kill me now. We have space available, and so we want to kind of worship with you together in this place if you are able to do it. Okay? And so let us prepare our hearts for a celebration preceding our 16th anniversary. We've been uh, promoting a family conference, but it's been altered to be a family connection. And so you should have gotten an email from us this past week that announces our family connection. That will be next Saturday, the 11th, at 10 o'clock here at Crossroads. It's just a gathering where we can all come together and just fellowship with one another, reconnect and engage uh, as we may not have seen each other for a while. Okay, so we're going to have some fun. We're going to have some, some games and a raffle, what have you. So come on out and say hi to someone that you may not have seen in a long time, that you may have waved to on, on Facebook. But we're going to just enjoy a time of gathering and fellowship. And that's going to take place next Saturday at, a, at 10 here on the church grounds. Amen? Amen. Now, save your date. Uh, go get your calendar and save the date because next month there's going to be a... Uh, the, the annual women's conference. The annual women's conference will be next month. It's going to be virtual. You get more details. But mark in your calendar, uh, in your phone, to uh, uh, make sure that you block out the ninth. Ladies, this is for the ladies. Ladies, ladies conference. Make sure that you block out the ninth, and you'll get information about that as it is uh, available. Okay? Make sure you check the app. If you have not yet downloaded the app, I encourage everyone to do so. So lots of information on our activities and timelines and Zoom accounts, or Zoom links for our Bible study is also on our lap. So make sure that we do that. Amen? Now, I want to do something a little bit different. We're going to go back in terms of fellowship and engaging. I want to recognize all of those who are celebrating a birthday in the month of the, I'm sorry, the month of September. So if you're celebrating a, a birthday in the month of September, we want to wish you an early happy birthday. Those have already had a birthday between September 1 and 4, happy belated birthday. And those that are celebrating an anniversary in the month of September, happy anniversary to you as well. Amen? And so we just want to make sure that we acknowledge those. We're not sliding those who have not, uh, who've had birthdays from January through August. Happy belated birthday to you too. Amen. Amen. We just want to make sure we welcome those and acknowledge those who have birthdays and anniversary. Amen. Amen. Now, giving. Giving. We're coming up to our last point. We want to make sure that you understand how to give. I see, saw someone earlier today drop something in the, uh, in the offering box that's in our sanctuary. So if you're here and you want to drop an offering, your offering, in the tithe box on your way out, please do so. That's for those of us in the sanctuary. Those that want to mail in your check, you still can do that. 647 East Pleasant Run Road, DeSoto, Texas. We've said it every week, but we want to make sure that those who are watching new, for those who are tuning in for the first time, that's our physical address. We will receive your check that way. You can also go online, CrossroadsCovTV uh, slash give. Follow the prompts that way, and you can uh, do it electronically. And also, you can text any amount to 84321. Text any amount, $1,000, hey, $5,000, God is faithful. I mean, hey, somebody has it. We don't know who has that, who's going to give. God is going to put it on somebody. It's hard to give. Amen. Amen. 84321 to tithes or offerings. I'm sorry. Uh, you can designate it for, to go to tithes or offerings, but any amount uh, to 84321. Amen? All right. Let us stand. I hope you've had a wonderful time with the Lord. Janet's is going to uh, guide us through Aaron's blessing, and then I'll come and close, give us our closing prayer. Amen. Would you please extend your hands this way? I'm going to bless you, and then you are going to turn and bless your neighbor. If you're worshiping with us online, you can bless yourself if you look in the mirror. Or you can look out your window and bless your neighbor that way. Amen. Or around your home, however it is. But I want to, we want to offer a blessing to you and then allow you to be God's hands and feet and bless someone else. And you'll just repeat after me. With a smile on your face. 
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you. And be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance on you. May the Lord lift his countenance on you. And may he keep you in perfect peace. May he keep you in perfect closing prayer. Thank you, Father, for meeting us where we are. Thank you for meeting our needs. Thank you, God, for molding us and shaping us. Thank you, God, for your faithfulness. Now, Lord, as we go, may we be encouraged and motivated, convicted to share our love of you and your love for others. Help us, God, to Speak of your goodness, to show kindness to one another, to go out of our way to be kind, not to avoid, but to engage. I pray, God, that they will see you in us, and you will be glorified. Now, God, continue to protect us as we go. We continue to heal those who need your healing hand. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We'll see you next week at 10 o'clock.